This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released September 12th, 2021, episode 557, Generic Nodes with Orkin Amir Slanov. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. Hello, uh, my name is Orkan Amarslanov, and I'm a hardware developer from the Things Industries. Hey, Orkan, how are you? I'm good, Chris. Thanks for having me. And oh. uh, hello to all the listeners and viewers, if there are any. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are doing video here. We're hopefully going to be able to show off some of the stuff that Orkan's been working on. And people may have heard the Things Industries before, me talking about it, other people talking about it. It is LoRaWAN based. Can you give people a rundown? On a reminder on what LoRa and LoRaWAN is generally. Sure. So there are lots of radio protocols currently in the market, and LoRaWAN or LoRa is actually one of them, very popular in the LP1 or Low Power Wide Area Network protocol. Uh, it's actually invented by Semtech, and in the recent years, it gained quite a bit of popularity between the IoT community, and in 2015, uh, the Things Network or Things Industries took this idea and uh, they run with uh, creating publicly an open source LoRaWAN network server, which people would buy the gateways from different vendors, even uh, the gateway of, of the Things Industries, and then install it in their home, in the apartment, or in their backyard. And this would serve as a sensor network. And the gateway is like a dummy device which forwards the data to the LoRa server. And then you have your own account and all the data is encrypted. You can you can do whatever you want with that data. Basically, LoRa, LoRa as a protocol is very good. The name or the meaning of the LoRa, it's, it means long range. But uh, because it uses a protocol or like a chip, which was, I believe, invented in World War II for the very long range communication. So it uses uh, chips of packets and it, it's really resistant against noise and other uh, radio interferences. So being resistant, being long range, uh, is also very low power. So typical uh, LoRa transceivers, it can go down to less than one microamp sleep currents. So that's very good for battery powered devices. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and it's definitely still higher during transmit. They're doing yeah. a little bit higher for a little bit lower for receive, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very impressive uh, what's out there. Low bandwidth though, too. People should always remember that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> low and slow, but yeah, slow. It's, it's very slow. It's it's yeah. not very useful for real time applications. Whenever you need mm -hmm. to to hide data rate transmission for that, two point four gigahertz, NRF or Bluetooth or Wi Fi would be more suitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And I think the, the thing that I always think about with LoRaWAN is like, it seems like it was like the, the networking engineers got in there and they're like, well, we can make, we can make it more like a true network. Right. So it's like you basically are routing packets. It's everything's kind of treated more like a traditional, uh, you know, like a traditional it setup. Yeah. Almost. Like the OC model there, are, I think two layers of the OC model mm -hmm. they are implemented Mac layer and physical layer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very similar to the 802.1504 stack. It's actually inherits lots of stuff from there. Oh, cool. But instead of using IP, it uses the device EUIs and a couple of security layers involved, like a network session yeah. key, application session keys. I think you know that already. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, a little bit. I mean, I, I haven't used, I've used uh, LoRa by itself. I've used like an RF. Mm -hmm. RF, no, what's the Hope F RF modules? The 96, RF, 95? RFM 60, uh, RFM 95. 95, okay, yeah. So yeah. I've used those. Basically, I think I was using like an Adafruit, Feather, LoRa mm -hmm. Feather, you know, just talking to one another, right? So like point to point, yeah, just point real point. simple, low power, great, worked out awesome. As long as nobody else was talking to the channel, as long as I, you know, didn't mess up the encoding that I had input in there, you know, because I was basically like compressing down to bits. But this is like much, many more layers above that, right? So this is like, exactly. now you're doing that same thing for a node, but then you also have a processor that's also handling communication. And then there's the the stacks all the way up, 
And uh, it is basically a star network where all the sensors are sending data in a Aloha style. So there, one sensors can wake up and send the data uplink anytime they want, usually, and then the gateway receives it, and then the sensors, the nodes open receive window uh, in a LoRa class A for the downlink communication. That's for class A. Then there are a couple of uh, lower one classes. There is a class A, class B, and C. The most simple one is the class A. Then the, the, after the uplink, gateway transfers the data or forwards the data to the network server, and the network server transfers to the application server. Then you can do a visualization. You can do long-term data logging, whatever mm -hmm. you want, uh, yeah. or even machine learning on top of that, on top of the data. Yeah. Yeah, and it does. It. Uh, I remember there was also there's like eight eight channels. How many channels are there? There's like that you for can... Europe. It is eight channels, and okay. I believe for US there should be two more. So, oh, okay. All right. Uh, for yeah. nine fifteen band, there are two more bands. Yeah, because that was the other thing I remembered. I remember that Rock Wireless, I think, makes a receiver as well, like a like a Raspberry Pi based receiver. But then there's yes. also like the commercial ones that the Things Industries makes, mm -hmm. and then I think at one point was. We had a guest on Richard Enos of TWTG, and I, I'm not yes. sure if he's still there. And they were building one of the things for the things industries. And then there's other people as well. It was like Arduino based um, mm -hmm. Things Uno yes. and uh, the Things Node. So they were the earlier version of the like a sensor nodes or prototyping devices for the things industries. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. And I remember, I think Dave Jones had bought one of the. Yes, receivers yeah. as well. So. He ranted quite a bit about the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the things yeah. node and the gateway because I think he had I, some troubles with the software setup. <laughs> I believe it was configured that the, the, the units that he received by default was configured for EU eight sixty eight. Yeah, and in Australia you have nine twenty, and um, he had to reconfigure it. So that was a bit of a you, you know, have to Australia. read the manual first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that is upside down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that is a good point though about the the uh, the different frequencies as well. So eight sixty eight in yep. the EU, nine fifteen, I believe, around here. Yep. There's a shared four thirty three that not as many people use, I believe. No, uh, it's four seventy for China and okay. slightly different for Japan and uh -huh. India. Okay. We also had JP Norera on the show. Yeah. Uh, and he talked about Laura a little bit, but he was not as big a fan. He was working on that Hay stack or some kind of other stack thing. Yes, they are using Laura as a physical transceiver, but they are mm -hmm. building on top of it to make it more resistant. I I, yeah. I listened to that episode; yeah. it was really nice. Yeah, yeah, that was a uh, it was interesting to hear that. You know, because like I had obviously I hear a lot of like the popular media stuff. I you know I did some research on my own and just reading around other things network stuff, and I hadn't heard. Otherwise, and then JP's like, oh, well, Dash 7's better, and, you know, here's why. And, yeah, just getting different inputs on these things is, yeah. you know, you don't know all of it until you've talked to people in the industry and, oh, this this is good, this sucks, this sucks, <laughs> that, you know, this is good, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's uh, it's good to just hear all these different perspectives. And I think the things industries and, you know, the, the open source backend stuff has been improving over time, too. Yes. Now, uh, late, recently, we've released uh, the, the ThinkStack version 3. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the, the commercial, uh, sorry for the background noise. Okay. So we have the commercial offering, the, the thing stack, and we also have the, the things network, which is open for public. And we have also moved the things network from version two to version three. And mm -hmm. many people who had gateways and, and devices connected had to migrate those to V3. Mm. How did that go? <laughs> well, it's going fine. We have lots yeah. of instruction, easy to follow instructions, and it's yeah. basically just copying the gateway UI and pasting in the new interface, and, and usually good to go. Yeah, yeah. And so the things, so just to disambiguate here too, the things network is what someone could go and buy or build a node and put it onto this open source kind of general data collector thing, right? And then it's like a community sourced thing. Is that right? So the, the things network, let's say you're living in an area where there's a gateway reception nearby, somebody already installed it, or yeah. there could be that some telco uh, company have installed it already. Yeah. And you can use that gateway to relay your information 
to your yeah. backend. Yeah. If there are no gateway reception, uh, you can install your own gateway and enable it to be uh, on the Things network, uh, basically to serve the community, but also you can use it for your own purposes. Got it. Got it. And then the... this is the public, but you can also use the LoRaWAN as a privately. Everything would That's be right. private. You can you can host it in your local computer or somewhere in the cloud, and there, no, nothing will be open to the public. Right. And so then, if so, if I'm running my own cloud, my own gateways, that would be the thing stack, right? That would be like, I would be using this, either I'm licensing it, or there's the open source version as well. And then yes. that's handling all of the packets that are coming in. And they're just for my, so say I have a client as a consultant, I'm like, hey, you should be using LoRaWAN, I think we should use the thing stack. It's all going to be private, you know, so it's encoded, it's got keys all the way through the the data is coming back through that sort of thing. Exactly. It's more the thing stack from the things industries is suitable more for the commercial applications mm -hmm. yeah and the things network is for public but you can use the things network as a at the initial phase of your device mm -hmm. designing and prototyping yeah just to get the uh, like proof of concept yep yeah nothing's more frustrating than thinking a device you're, you're looking at the UART, you're like it's sending packets where, <laughs> where, where are they <laughs> exactly yeah yeah uh, okay, well, let's. We're gonna get to the hardware for sure. Mm -hmm. You've built some very interesting hardware. I'd like to talk about, but I'd like to get a little bit background on you first. So, how did you kind of come to be working for the Things Industries and on this on this stuff? Well, yeah, it's it's a nice uh, long <laughs> story, but I'll try to keep it short. So, I'm actually originally from Azerbaijan, and uh, it's a small country, post-Soviet country, between Russia and Iran in Caucasus, and so. I did my bachelor's there and starting from 2007, I did a industrial automation and process control. And um, because our country is oil rich country and most of the people are basically following the, the jobs and leads in the petroleum industry. And I also did the same, but for me, electronics was always more interesting and I'm more of a mostly self-taught electronics hardware developer. <laughs> That's great. And after the, like, I was about to finish my bachelor's and decided to do the master's instead of, I also received a job offer in uh, back home, but I basically had to respectfully decline it and <laughs> follow the like lifelong passion of electronics. And I was expect, accepted to um, embedded master's program in uh, in Norway. It was a joint degree, first year in Norway, second year in Germany. And I basically went there, did my master's in two years. And during my master's on the second year in, while in Germany, I started working at the nearby company. It's called the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And I was working there as a student assistant. In that respect, it's really cool. There are lots of student jobs available where you can earn some pocket money yeah right <laughs> to support your studies yeah i mean well it, i mean there's a lot of good beer there so i mean exactly yeah and also, <laughs> also that <laughs> yeah basically i was earning my beer money more than enough and also learning uh, lots of cool stuff doing lots of cool stuff at that company and i also got to do my master thesis there and it was about you know this electroluminescent displays I think Ben Krasno did a really nice yeah, electroluminescent yeah. display of a Saturn a module. It was like a timing module, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I was basically doing a similar thing and designing a driver module for it using tons of triacs. I was going to say it's high voltage usually, right? It is high voltage. And I also had to design the, the inverter myself and got oh. electrocuted a couple of times. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it, it's it uses high frequency, high voltage AC, so like 200 volts between 200 and 500 hertz AC, and I, I had a some protection on board. It went uh, like overcurrent protection, things like that. But still, oh, you, you would get some yeah. occasional that'll tickle, <laughs> touches that'll and tickle. tickles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, basically my master's project was building this 64 by 64 half or so, two feet by two 
two foot or feet. Yeah, 60, 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters, big display yeah, yeah. Yeah. using electroluminescent. And it turned out to be working functional, but it, using the AC, there were lots of leakage current. There was a uh -huh. ghosting effect, had to do lots of FPGA programming on top of that because FPGA was used to drive the display buffer, frame right. buffer, and, yep. and, yep. and there was lots of opto isolators driving the, the triax with a zero crossing detection, things like that. Wow. Yeah, there was lots of programming involved, but I managed to reduce the ghosting effect, but I mean, yeah, it wasn't enough. So is there a video of this anywhere though? We can maybe share? No, maybe, but maybe oh, I can okay. share with you the master thesis itself later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't as polished as, let's say, Ben, what Ben Krasnov did, well, because he was, using, he was using a very <laughs> small area and uh -huh. he didn't need much of a driving current to run each mm -hmm. pixel. And he, yeah. he ended up using one of those small uh, chips, with ha which has basically built-in uh, AC drivers, yeah. uh, 64 by 64, I believe. I think he still blew them up a bunch, though, too, right? It didn't yes, you? yes. I yeah, mean, those yeah. are, I, I tried to use them, but for my pixel size was around uh, five by five millimeters it was for oh, wow. bigger displays and the current was much higher than, than the chip you know they make panel. leds now i'm just saying you know yeah. <laughs> the leds are a lot easier <laughs> the thing is this this was um, quite easy to produce in the lab so we would uh -huh. make our own just use like a phosphor paste and the dielectric paste That's, laid yeah. on the with a with a screen printing yeah. And uh, we could easily print a display. You cannot do that with the OLED. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, and making like custom, you're so you're seeing like you can make custom patterns and things like exactly. that and light them up. Yeah. That's yeah, any shape you want or even right. you can, right. you can add a, like a, you can switch the display in between and use it mm -hmm. as a capacitive sensing. So you can oh, use wow. the same area to do uh -huh. the sensing as a touch input, also display the result there. Wow. And I mean, is the touch input 500 volts as well? No, so you, have, you, you switch the device, basically. Get, You're yeah. not running it at that time. Yeah, that's cool. No, that's really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, and it was around that time I started looking to this thing's network and I started because, uh, okay, after my master thesis, I started working at that company as a fellow research assistant and, and started doing lots of wireless sensor network hardware development. I was basically designing mostly Bluetooth, sometimes Wi-Fi, and sometimes custom 2.4 gigahertz based sensor nodes, which would read the data, collect the data, and then we would run a couple of, let's say, uh, experiments, and then use that data, collect the data to do uh, machine learning on top of it. Oh, cool. For example, just using an accelerometer to find or to detect the person who is wearing the sensor based on the or uh, walking patterns or movement patterns, things like that. Yeah. Or we also had the right, capacitive sensors installed under the carpet and based on the gate analysis, walk, try to find who is walking on this carpet. So basically wow. non-invasive, not using camera, but all the other sensors to detect the person, to detect who is walking to on. Detect a specific person you're saying. Like exactly, that. exactly. Yeah. And someone who doesn't even have like a super de like definitive walk, like they don't have like a limp or something like that. They're just, they just walk in a certain way. They have heavy footsteps or they. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Just the uh, cool. frequency of the steps or uh, yeah. how, how the steps are printed, imprinted on Pretty the Pretty shuffle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And I was doing that as in my day job, but also got interested in the lower band technology and persuaded my boss to buy a those gateways and we installed a couple of them around the company in the top level or on the uh -huh. balcony, let's say, and opened it as a public, publicly open things network gateway. I also, after, afterwards, I started designing the, the actual boards just to, just for fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was, I believe it was around 2017 or end of 2017 microchip came, came up with the SAMR 34. It was the first. LoRaWAN or LoRa enabled SIP. So the Cortex M0 plus, plus a, a SX1276 LoRa SIP all in one package. And I, I met, I met them in the electronica, I believe in the fair, and they had this big uh, $99 development board 
What is yeah, MR34? I think, was, I think it was a B. It was the uh, one of their explained boards, I believe. Exactly. Right? Like, like, yeah. Though I I never understood that uh, platform. It was like. It has some cool features. It has some. Really I just thought nice it was like features, we'll break like, out every pin in the ugliest way possible. I feel like that was there. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's that's true. I totally agree with that. Yeah. But it, some of them has really nice like onboard power measurement, ah, that's and nice. you can you can do like a down to microamp, even nanoamp range. So you can also use the same board to do the current measurement mm -hmm. in other boards or also program oh, cool. the other boards. Yeah. Uh, so I basically got into their booth and I asked them, okay, they, they didn't have any modules available for this summer 34. And I decided to design my own. And at the time I started using KiCad. Since 2014, I started using KiCad. Nice. Thanks to you, by the way. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and for all my work at, at the, my day job, I started shifting everything to Kik, all the projects to KiCad. Yeah. And uh, also design, decided to design a radio module around 14 by 16 millimeters size, like very small uh, radio module around the SMR34. Basically took the explain board design, stripped down all the unnecessary part, kept the core part. Are you saying first. Iridium like the, the satellite? No, no, no. Or, sorry, what were you saying? Iridium module or something? You said some kind of module. No, the radio module. The oh, radio SMR module. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay I, heard, I misheard so you. Basically, yeah. there was no commercially available radio module for the summer. Got it. Yes, I that's decided right. to design my own using. Yeah, G I remember you were posting about it on yeah. on Twitter a bunch as well, and I was so excited about it because it was just like, and it was all. It's like a really very fine pitch BGA as well, right? Yes, yes, it is. I believe zero point five. Yeah, uh, the the PCB design itself was also basically like using doing doing the keycap. It was a very manual process, we were doing four layer, very small board, trying yeah. to fit everything, all the vias, and also trying to keep the cost low because right. as you know, the, the drill size and the annular ring, if it gets too small, the, the price just jumps That's quite right. high. Yeah. <laughs> right, even PCB way will, will charge you many thousands if you, if you want them to. <laughs> yep. But I managed to fit everything into one board and managed to get it fabricated by Oshpar. Hmm. Because of the, the PCB width, the, the track width was too small. Some of the tracks got uh, short circuited, but I had to manually just take the exacto knife and just cleared all the tracks and yeah. made a couple of uh, prototypes <laughs> for this board. Yeah. And it started working and uh, I was, constantly posting the updates on Twitter and people got interested and lots of people contact me and you want to sell this because they were also interested in the module for the SMR34 yeah. and there was nothing available. Actually, Microchip, Microchip came up with an official module from, from them about two years later. Mm. Only <laughs> there was a couple of modules <laughs> like the Rack 4260, yeah. which was released about a year after, but at the time there was nothing available. And I also posted all the design files on, on uh, GitHub and basically went with the uh, low volume manufacturing of this module and I started selling them on Tindy. Make, made a feather board for it, like a breakout board. I actually have it here. Hold on a second. I can do this. I, I know how to do this. There we go. <laughs> all right. Yes. So the, so showing, so just to paint a little word picture here. So it looks like you, so you built your own module here, like a castellated yep. edge. Uncertified, just to be. Un that's right, right. But yeah. it's a basically a breakout for the SAMR34 so that exactly. people could easily put that onto their their designs. Mm -hmm. And so it's tiny, it's, yeah. So did you end up staying with Hosh Park for, the, for that module then too? Uh, no, no, no. I, oh, I okay. went to China and uh, I believe I used PCB GoGo at a time uh -huh. and they, they offered a really nice pricing mm -hmm. and they yeah, it was the yield total yield was like about ninety percent, mm. and yeah, it was good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I mean, and then you you have like a lot of these little breakouts, and then you can put the rest, put it onto a larger board. So then you yeah. also sell the penguino. Uh, what's the penguino? Is that right? Yeah, this is like a, a family of devices, LoRaWAN uh, mm -hmm. transceivers, and all yeah. of them are open source. You can... Yeah, and you have the uh, the the first Azerbaijan. Uh, open source <laughs> hardware number here exactly for the uh 4260 yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty cool the rack wireless one yeah so that's so that's based on the rock wireless module basically yep. which is is certified or is not certified 
that is certified that is also samr 34 based got it okay cool yeah and so and then yeah this is nice for doing breakouts it's all feather form factor looks like mm -hmm. yeah it's i great. basically have a now i have i basically have a like a template circuit mm -hmm. for like power supply for battery monitoring battery protection short circuit protection things mm -hmm. like that and yeah. then i just throw in every new module there yeah. just for testing and then totally. create a nice breakout better base yeah. breakout for it yeah yeah, I've been using Feather for stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, form factor. Yeah, it's uh, really nice. And you can find lots of like a 3D cases for it. I printed a mm -hmm. bunch of them and he was just given it away on the Tindy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And so then using, using the SAMR34, so a Cortex-M0, how is the driver support and everything like that? I mean, like, what is there a library to talk to Laura, uh, the SX1276? Uh, yes, so there's an official part, so uh, Atomel uh, software framework as uh, so official support. But for that, unfortunately, you, I have to use Atomel Studio, which is Windows based only. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of community support. It, uh, lately, people have ported it to a platform IO. There's oh, cool. also support for Arduino from Mexican guys, the Electronic Cats. They, they oh, did yeah, a those nice guys are great. Yeah, 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 they yeah. did a nice board and they ported it to Arduino and it also works with all the LoRaWAN drivers and some of the device drivers. Oh, that's great. And then, I mean, so these things are out there, right? People are buying these on Tindy and using them in their projects and whatever. Yeah, you can, the Electronic Cats version, they also sell it directly from Rec Wireless website mm -hmm. and you can buy it from there, but also there are lots of small makers, hardware makers like me, and they're selling it in Tindy and other sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you have something like the Penguino Feather SAMR34. It's a LoRa-based device, mm -hmm. and you want to put that onto a LoRaWAN device like the Things Network, right? Just kind of trying to piece all this together, right? We've gone mm -hmm. all the way from the, the chip to a module that you built. The module goes onto a board. The board works in a system. It's talking to a sensor, maybe you've te getting a temperature, uh, temperature boring. You're getting a <laughs> air quality monitoring PMI yeah. from a uh, Sensirion expensive ass little green brick. And yeah. uh, <laughs> you're getting the readings back and you're getting PM 2.5 part particulate monitoring. And you mm -hmm. want to pipe that back over LoRaWAN now. How do you actually tie all that stuff together? On the device side, it's very easy. On your Things Network account, you basically create a new application and create a new device. You copy the device credentials to your sensor and basically flash it with those new credentials. And then you have a LoRaWAN stack running on your device. You can uh, read the sensors, sensor data and encapsulate it in the, let's say, a buffer of a, of a transmission buffer and then send it over LoRaWAN to your application. And on your uh, TTN account, you will receive the data stream coming. You can implement a payload decoder on top of it because you have to compress the data and oh, use okay. only the important bits. Yeah. And let's say not send a, a double or integer. You can even like make it a byte, a couple of bytes, oh, wow. and then... So no no JSON with uh, <laughs> lots of overhead on no, these things? No, 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 no. Yeah. With, with LoRaWAN, the, the, the packet size is quite limited. So th there are a couple of uh, spreading factors involved and based on the spreading factor that decides how far your, your radio transmission would go and how much data you can transmit. At SF7, you can transmit up to 230 kilobytes or uh, yes, 230 kilobytes, but very close range, let's say okay. one or two kilometers, depending on your gateway. But at SF12, you can only transmit maybe 50 bytes only. And the data rate will be very slow, but the range can go to many, many kilometers. Like Andreas Spies, so the guy with the Swiss accent, he did a, <laughs> like a, a LoRaWAN world record from yep. very long distance. I think it was about 149 kilometers. Oh my God, that's and crazy. And last year in our conference, they did a... They installed a sensor node on a balloon, the helium balloon, and it was mm -hmm. sending the data from above, I believe, 750 kilometers. Oh my god! <laughs> at SF12, so it was a yeah. It on a line of sight, and if the weather condition is good, it can go really long distances. 
That's great. Yeah, I guess K, uh, 750 is straight up. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Makes it a little <laughs> well, easier. It you was, have to worry about it was the... up and like it was drifting. Oh, it was? Okay. Eastern right. Europe. And it was wow. received by somewhere in Germany, a, a gateway somewhere Got in Germany. Got it. Yeah, right. So that is the other benefit, yeah, is that you, are, you might ping a different node. And also that was another thing I remember from the network side of things is that a packet might hit multiple nodes, right? It's basically a broadcast from a tiny thing. And then all these, these receivers are like, Hey, I got it. I got it. I got it. And then you could even, there's, is there triangu triangulation with that yet or, or no? Uh, they are working on it. I believe the okay. new standard allows you to do the, uh, mm -hmm. like the non GPS, just the LoRa, pure LoRa based sure. triangulation. Basically, if your packet gets received by the many gateways and the network server will decide which gateways data I'm going to use. Usually it picks the one with the highest RSSI and which is mm -hmm. the closest to the device mm -hmm. so that the device can also do automatic data rate adjustment. Uh, mm -hmm. If the device is close to the gateway, there is no need to transmit at highest power available or uh, at the, like it's a SF12, you can go down to SF7 and also you can save down power, let's say instead of 14 dBm, you send that 10 dBm or 8 dBm. Mm, got it. Yeah. So you start to save battery. Yeah, start to exactly. Save. Yeah, right. With more applications within the class A applications, it's all, all about saving the battery and extend the battery life. Yeah, right. And then I, uh, I've seen 10 year battery life kind of specs, you know, that's yeah. right. That's people always talk about 10 years, right? <laughs> well, yeah, the battery will be dead long before the sure. device itself. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you can technically you can achieve it if you do a careful design, mm -hmm. and and if you transfer maybe once a day or so, uh, and then you can achieve that that kind of long battery life. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. So okay, to go back to so you said SF twelve, it might get a kilobyte or so of data. Yep. And then tens of kilometers. So it's kind of like the numbers that I wrote down. SF twelve couple of bytes, let's say 50 bytes. A couple maximum. of bytes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yep. It's very slow. <laughs> okay. Got it. And then, so that's what I'm really wondering there. So you said 230 kilobytes for an SF seven, a spreading factor seven. Yeah. So what is it like a window? Like what determines that? Cause you could just send another packet after that, but it's, is it like a window that within that packet range or what? Uh, in Europe, there's this thing called a uh, fair use policy. Uh, okay, we are using the uh, ISM band uh -huh. and what we cannot keep constantly sending the data. You Got have it. to somehow be polite and allow all the other users who are sharing the same bandwidth with you to have some bandwidth allocation. So there's this 1% rule, uh, duty cycle rule, that once you send the packet, depending on your packet size, you have to wait. There, there's a certain dead time, let's say. Mm. Uh, that's a 1%, let's say, if you're sending a couple of packets every day, and it amounts to, let's say, 36 seconds. And the rest of the time, 3,500 whatever seconds, you have to be sleeping. Hmm. Okay. That uh, You can allow however you want. You can have a SF7, very small packet, sent once every hour. Or you can send everything at once, use up all your bandwidth, and then sleep and wake up I the see. next day. Got it. So you take all the, all the seconds in a day. You get one percent of those. Okay. Yep. And then yeah, then the rest, then the rest of the formula is just how much battery you want to spend on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's good. Yeah. I mean, so from your experience now, seeing seeing devices in the field, both as a independent hardware maker and now as someone making hardware for a network, mm -hmm. what are most people doing? It's mostly used in the industry and in agriculture and smart city. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. It's very the LoRaWAN or LoRa itself as a radio protocol, it's not like a one, one protocol to use in every situation. It has its own mm -hmm. niche application where there are, the, the data is not changing very frequently, let's say temperature and humidity, uh, like for the slow changing data over time, let's say once every hour or so, you can use it. Or you can do the local logging and maybe even using like a tiny ML, do the machine learning and uh, classification on the device and then send the, the results as an event, detected events once every hour. Mm. You can do that for, let's say, preventative maintenance and do like a vibration monitoring on the board and uh, even do a, like a, a energy harvesting from that vibration so the device would 
extend its own battery, battery life. Hmm. Otherwise, it's also being used in agriculture for like a crop soil temperature, humidity measurement. There's a popular project, Arduino-based, uh, called Winduino. It's being yeah, used Rainier, in... Yeah, uh, uh, I forget his last Rainier, name. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, he did one of the early uh, Hackaday Prize. That's how I met him. I exactly, yeah. 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 That's one popular one. And yeah. uh, there are lots of device makers now. If you go to our website, uh, thingsindustries.com, and there's a device marketplace. There are lots of listed gateways and sensor nodes where you can basically, there are like dev board style devices also ready to use with the proper mm -hmm. IP rating. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, and the agriculture thing makes sense too, because it's like, so having worked in the cellular industry and like people <laughs> are like, oh, I'm going to have like a, a thing, you know, in every field, I'm going to have like a, you know, a cellular device there. It's like, well, okay, make sure you have a tower nearby and also make sure you have a car <laughs> battery nearby. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but people really well. don't want to, some people don't want to pay the subscription fee of the, sure. that, yeah, for yeah. each, each sensor node. And yeah. the, the power consumption is really huge yeah. with yes. the 3G or 2G modems. Yeah. And, and there is now a bit like MBIOT, LTEM, which is a bit more low power, but still- I was actually talking about those even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even those, they, they yeah. really can't compare with the lower band because That's right. you still has to wake up periodically and send a, let's say, I'm alive signal to the tower. Right, unless you want with, to do a those. full refresh and then you have to yes. like basically reprovision another not IP address, mm -hmm. but another connection to the tower. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's for very special use cases. <laughs> yes. I mean, you, if you have some sort of, let's say solar based or, or vibration based, uh, energy harvesting, where you can yeah. extract some energy and extend the battery life, then those could be useful as well, because mm -hmm. Laura is not perf perfect for all those applications. If you, yeah. if you just need. IP based device where you can send UDP packets or TCP IP packets directly to your server and you don't want to involve in like an intermediary gateway, things like that, then you can use MBIOT or LTM based device. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is, it's a general good practice to like have to be, so if someone's like trying to be a solutions provider across many, you know, remote data sensing type of things. Have a bunch of tools in your tool belt, right? I was just talking to a yeah. friend about this the other day. You know, have a cellular device that you're comfortable with. Have a LoRa device you're comfortable with. Have a Wi-Fi device you're comfortable with, right? If you're doing high bandwidth, you don't want to be on either of those things because you don't want to pay for cellular. You don't want LoRa is not good for high bandwidth, and it's just like you need to have all of these things because there is no perfect thing there. You know? Yeah, you don't want to lock yourself into one technology and yeah. just keep using it for every application. I believe it was a. Uh, Richard from TWTG that he was mentioning that he tried to use it for bicycle racing and to monitor oh, yeah, the right. real time, yeah. uh, real time, uh, uh, like pedal pushing off the rider, but he was getting lots of delays because Laura was just wasn't the technology for this That's application. Right. Yeah, he needs something with low latency and Laura cannot really provide that. Yeah. I mean, do you find that people are doing uh, like aggregation on device? So you said with, you know, spreading factor seven, you could do 230 kilobytes per packet. You could do one to two kilo kilometers per thing. But do you find that people are like logging data, compressing it into like a table format and then just spitting that whole thing back? Maybe it's not very um, There are There recent. are several, there are several, let's say, um, byte encoding techniques that people use mm -hmm. to condense the data uh, into let's say a single or let's say four four byte value into a single byte even half the byte a word like four byte uh, four bits word and then you decode it on the on your TTN account or whatever uh, network server you're using B because the bandwidth is very crucial and you're trying to condense the, the packet size as much as you want to reduce the airtime. That's the most uh, power consuming part of the LoRaWAN doing the transmission. In let's say 14 dBm, uh, depending on the module you're using or, or radio uh, chip you're using, can go up to 60 milliamp. And in 22 dBm in US can go up to 150, 180 milliamps. Basically some batteries are not even able to 
provide that much instant current rush. You have to have lots of decoupling as well for the 22 dBm. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Well, let's talk about your uh, the thing you've actually been building on behalf mm -hmm. of the Things Industries and the Things Network. What what are we looking at here? Uh, once I pull it up. <laughs> so, as as I mentioned earlier, I was designing this open source Penguino family of devices, and Vinke, the, the CEO of the the Things Industries, has seen some of my designs on LinkedIn, and he contacted me and said, "Hey, hey, hey we want to." design something similar uh, with, with more, let's say, ready to use everything enclosed in one nice enclosure and with a couple of sensors around. And do you want to come work for us? He said, yeah, why not? <laughs> and, sure, I'm not doing anything, you know, this week, <laughs> Well, I was, I, was, I was having a bit of a, let's say, burnout at my car, uh, previous uh, company. Yeah, and yeah. it was already four years that I've been working there and I needed something new and it was really a perfect fit for me to move to Amsterdam and start uh, doing this cool project. And so cool project, cool city. I mean, <laughs> cool company. Like, yeah, this seems, yeah. seems pretty ideal. So yeah, everything fit together nicely. Yeah. So um, there was a generic node idea in the company and they started developing initial version uh, with the Samar 34, but um, that project didn't took off. Like they had the early prototypes, but didn't took off. There was some hardware issues with it. And they, uh, at the time, ST has released this new chip, STM32WL. Oh, and uh, we as a company have a really good relationship with ST. They are in, uh, even though they didn't have custom chip for LoRaWAN, they're being, they're being used in many of the LoRa modules as a yeah. main microcontroller. Right. So it was a natural fit and uh, they de decided to help us a lot with the, the design phase and also supplying uh, like early samples. And, and you're like, in, uh, in a couple of years, there will probably be no problems getting ST parts. <laughs> well, well, we'll see. We'll see about the such a, such a big shortages. company. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do have a, a, you know, the ST has this longevity program. Yeah. And some of the parts, they promise that for the next 10 years, it will be available. Yeah. I believe this part is also one of them. So we decided to so use that, is that you could, I'm sorry, I keep making jokes yeah. about ST parts. No does that problem. mean you could get them in 10 years or they'll still be available in 10 years? <laughs> well, some of them you, you will get in five years if you order now. <laughs> oh man. It's like, it's almost like gallows humor. It's like, if we don't laugh about it, we're going to cry. So <laughs> well, there are two ways. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, boy. It's, it's hard right. to, it, it, it's hard. Like you can laugh if you have nothing to do with it, but if you are yeah. in the business and oh, you need those chips, badly, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. You just have to cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we decided to use this STM thirty WL. It's a it's a really nice chip. It's a yeah. it's a first LoRa SOC which integrates the LoRa transceiver inside the SOC. So so this so this is different than the the some R thirty four or sorry yeah. the Edmo yeah yeah microchip now microchip. microchip. Yes. Oh, now microchip previously had not. <laughs> that was actually a SIP, you said, right? So it had. That was SIP. So it was yeah. a different die. Yeah. Microcontroller okay. and the transceiver was different die, but this one combines everything into one die. It has right. More integration and right. smaller size. So this uh, is like ST basically licensed the design from yeah. Semtech, put it yeah. onto their chip, tested it all together. Yeah. It's one yeah. contiguous thing. Yeah. Great. Exactly. Okay. And they have two versions of two, two main versions. One is a single core, the other one's dual core. We opted for the dual core version, which has Cortex M4 and M0 plus. Oh, cool. And the single core version has just M4. Okay. Yeah. And then we decided what sensors to put on the, on the sensor, on the, on the node, what kind of interfaces should we have to make it a bit more developer friendly, have us. Uh, standard pitch, 100 mil pin headers for programming and also expansion. Also have a quick connector if you want to add the I2C based devices to it. Yep. And have a, a like a quite a wide range, a wide input voltage from two volts up to 5.5 volts with a JST connector. So you can use LiPo or lithium iron phosphate or two or three double A's or triple A's in series. So we, we decided to have this, all this flexibility to the user. And at the end, uh, uh, I was really rooting for it that to make it 
fully open source, all the hardware design files, yeah. schematics, PCB, BOM files, and including the SDK, we made it open source. Uh, and every, anybody who wants to look at the design, they can just uh, yeah, use it as a reference design for their own or yeah. Yeah, whoever. Yeah, because that's what you want, right? You want more people exactly. building more things. This is a generic node. Then you want people to go and build the specific nodes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like a in-between device. It's both a dev yeah. development board, but it's also a ready to use industrial and certified device. Yeah. It's going to be certified. For now, it's going to be C certified for EU mm -hmm. only, but later on, we are going to do the FCC as well. Got it. As a general thing, I mean, do you see, I mean, I, I would imagine with the things in industries being a Amsterdam based company, there's probably a lot of EU based interest, but mm -hmm. do you see the split US and uh, EU? I mean, or even out other markets, China, uh, Europa, not Europa, Australia, Asia, or whatever they call Oceania, that's it. I like yeah. uh, Australia, Oceania. New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there are not much of a split <laughs> because most of the people who are interested in using this is are like a agriculture based or uh, industrial it. monitoring companies who want, mm -hmm. wants to retrofit their devices with, uh, instead of like a wired connection, they want to use LoRaWAN mm. as a, like a offer a wireless version of the sensors, even like a big railroad companies in Europe are trying to use it now for like a platform monitoring, even like sync their clocks, they're using LoRaWAN for it. Like all, really? all across the whole country, they are like syncing the clocks within like a less than a second timing precision <laughs> using LoRaWAN. I figured that would have been like a solved problem by now, but I guess not. <laughs> Mostly it is. Mostly. Oh, okay. well, it depends. I figured oh. like you stick a GPS module on something that gets like network time from like satellites, right? Yeah, but they have to keep the cost low. If you uh, add GPS to every clock, then adds up quite significantly. Yeah, true. Yeah, and, and power hungry too, right? I mean, they call also power this. hungry, yes. Yeah. But because the other idea is to, if there's a power outage, they can uh, still operate the device remotely. Got it. Using a, a self powered gateway or a yep. gateway with the UPS mm -hmm. and the cell cellular connection, then it will be much easier to maintain the network. Yep. Cool. Okay. With our generic node, we basically used like a jelly bean parts of, of uh, sensors, temperature, humidity sensor, uh, accelerometer. We have a really nice buck boost converter with a, from Recall. It's a, it basically has a 300 nanograms of quiescent current. So it wow. can go really low. What I said that this is a both developer friendly and also industrial ready device. So it, it is designed to be low power. You can switch off the power gating all the sensors, even the, the ex expansion part. And uh, in sleep mode, we've measured something around 1.7, mic 1.8 microamps, Very putting nice. the microcontroller in a, in a stop mode three. Yeah, and basically I can, I can show you the, the enclosure itself, how it looks. I have one as well, somewhere around here. Unfortunately, everything's yes. around here still in boxes, <laughs> but. Uh... Uh, can you show it again? Sorry, I didn't have your, your video large yeah, on the sorry. screen. So okay. that's the enclosure. Yeah, that's nice. It's basically, yeah. there's a user button here, RGB LED, small opening here for the temperature humidity sensor right right underneath the enclosure. Yep. Even though there's a hole, we've tacked it covered with a, a waterproof mesh, which are yeah. typically used on the smartphones. And it allows air, allows humidity uh, to some degree, but prevents the water so we can right. keep the IP65 rating. That's awesome. And yeah. the, the board itself, it's very like small. Yeah, it's hard friendly. to see when it's like huge on the screen. So yeah, that's yep. great that it's uh, in your <laughs> hand there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. It's 65 that's great. by 33 millimeters. So. And then what is the battery size that fits in that case too? Uh, in this case, we managed to fit in two double A's. Two double A's. Oh, great. Okay. Yep. So, so at 1.8 microamps, Theoretical max, if it was just sleeping the whole time, what would that get it? Uh, if it's just sleeping, uh, you would get more than 10 years. Oh, yeah. yeah if it's yeah. just sending one packet of, let's say, 20, 25 bytes every hour, and uh, you can get, expect three or four, maybe even five years of battery life. That's nice. We haven't done any like long-term extended battery life testing. <laughs> but it's, we, only, we... it's only been around for a year, not even. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we have a, a real nice partner, you know, Koitek. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 have this OT mini like the mm -hmm. power That's analyzer, like battery tester, battery yeah. tester, and they are going they are they are doing this uh, like uh, extended battery life measurements, and hopefully next month we will be able to tell exactly how much it's going oh, to be. Great. But just rough yeah. estimation with the online IoT calculators, with the tools that I have behind me. Uh, a measure so it's definitely going to be like four years five years with one that's uplink killer. every hour yeah once an hour that's that's very impressive so yeah. and then at, so what's the spreading factor there then too because that's again I'm, I'm i don't really have a good i'm sure that you've got this internalized at this point right yeah um well it's it's no problem we've made everything open source and we even mm -hmm. discuss most of many of the stuff in in the github issues as openly mm -hmm. as possible that's all great. the radio testing certification results, initial oh, pre-testing results, like a power yeah. measurement results. Uh, if there are some bugs on the board, we also highlight it there and which will be addressed with the next yeah. revision. There are not any uh, major issues with the board, only maybe like a labeling error in the first revision and which ah. will be fixed in the next revision. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, <laughs> that's why does, we yeah. have the revisions, you know? Yeah. It's an yeah. iterative process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And so tell me about the testing. So going through CE testing, what are, what are the limits like for, for the ISM band stuff as well? For Europe, so main limit is the output power of 14 dBm or 100 milliwatts. Uh -huh. And another limitation is, the, is following the 1% fair policy usage, uh -huh. duty cycling. And also not to have any spurious emissions, so mm, have yep. them low under a certain limit. So they are doing this uh, sweep while the device is running, doing continuous RF transmission. And then they're doing sweep of measurements from zero up to six gigahertz to find, are there any, let's say, harmonics or spurious emissions Got from it. the device itself. We try to shield the device and also use a, like a full layer design, sandwich all the high frequency lines in between and Covered with the ground plane, and basically you did an internal. You did an internal layer, like yeah, uh, oh, interesting internal tracks. So uh -huh. um, basically to keep everything, and it's my first board as a, like a commercial product and going through the certification. But I'm really happy that uh, it's still passing all the pre tests and yeah, that's great. Following uh, all the let's say re regulative uh, limitations. That's great. And then in terms of like the front end, do, is there like a, is there a preamp on there or like a power amplifier rather as well? Everything is built into the chip. It has a PA and a PA boost. You can use it for 22 dBm, but it has a, a low power output and high power, high power output. We are using it for EU. We are, we have internal switch and you're using software switch. You're using a low power output with a maximum of 14 dBm. So there is no way you can transmit higher than That's that. Nice. <laughs> but for the US, we are utilizing the high power path and that can go up to 22 dBm. Huh, I wonder why it's different here. Uh, mm -hmm. Any idea? Like why why it's 22 here versus there? It's just population density well, in, in this I, I <laughs> in guess the Midwest? It's density and, and the, the US is like huge and the distance, yeah, because yeah. of the distances, yeah, you need yeah, more Yeah, I guess our, our farmers are further apart, huh? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, yeah, how that's part of it, yeah. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, so there are a couple of commercially available modules for the uh, STM32WL, but they are using the high power path by default. You, you have to have lots of, let's say, RF matching network balloon uh, function on your PCB so, so that you can utilize both RF paths. But uh, they are using just default high power path in their modules. And the difference between low power and high power is the power consumption. So in high power, if you trans decide to transmit at 14 dBm, that's going to end up consuming about twice more current than you do the transmission at 14 dBm with the low power output. <laughs> Interesting. Just because yeah. of uh, logarithmic nature uh, of a different it circuit built in oh different circuit uh, okay All yeah right. it's, so. it's like a sub modules inside the radio transceiver one is dedicated for low power path output the other one is for the high power path output Got and it. high power yeah. is by design it consumes more power yeah hmm. 
So you only get two years instead of four. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, unfortunately, that is the case. But yeah. we, in our generic node, we decide to use both paths so that with the with the sacrifice of extra bomb parts on it, about 15 uh, more uh, passive components, let's say inductors and capacitors, plus an RF switch to switch in between low power path and high power path. But I think, yeah, that's going to be yeah. a more, like, let's say, it was a user-centric design decision so that gives sure. them more flexibility. If they want to save power, yeah, use a low power path even yeah. for US. Got it. Yeah. Well, and the uh, when people make their own specific node, they can rip off the high power path if they don't need it, right? Yep. That, yeah. Exactly. What are what what kind of costs are we talking about here? What does it cost to, to buy one to buy one of these? So if I was gonna go buy one, what does it cost? Well, right now we've did we did the low production volume of first phase, we did one hundred. And we we sold it. Or we basically gave away most of them for free. In the next run, we are doing five hundred, and that's gonna be about seventy bucks. But because of that low volume, uh, the initial cost is really high. But uh, in the next phase, we are doing this uh, higher volume. Let's say five thousand or even ten thousand nodes. Then then the um, MSRP we are planning is going to be around forty bucks. So. Well, that's great. We are yeah. trying to go as low as possible and not m make too much money out of it. I mean, sometimes not at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would think if it's the, you know, the things industries is making their money on the software piece, this is almost like a loss, not a loss leader, but like a, this is the thing to get people through the door, right? I'm in a very similar scenario often exactly. where the hardware is a enticement into like being part of a larger ecosystem. Exactly. Like to onboard the customer to the yeah. ecosystem and give them a easy to use tool and which which is also like an industrial ready to use device yeah, and yeah. which delivers what it promises to, so that they can uh, use our services and software services on top of it yeah i think the hard part is when uh, when a software company comes in and they don't quite understand hardware and they're like I would like to buy 50,000 of these so I could put them in the field, please. And you're like, nah. Yeah, nah, we had those. <laughs> yeah, that's not how this works, guys. This is a development platform. Like, this is not. But, yeah, I mean, that's the... the thing. It looks like it could, I mean, it, it could operate in that way. And people are like, well, here's a solution. Why can't I just buy this solution? I can go to Amazon and buy a blank, right? And it's like, well. Yeah, we are also planning to, like, license it and make, a like, a mm -hmm. custom version of the generic node. Use yeah. a bare bone. Use the SDK. Yeah. Yeah. and uh, use all our drivers and ecosystem because we are in our SDK, we are trying to make it as friendly as possible for the developers. So we have Azure RTOS, even like a ThreadX uh, version. We will have uh, Arduino support, embed support, and uh, bare metal, of course, and the free RTOS version, basically like all the popular choices there will be supported in, in this platform, in our SDK. Cool. And you said Azure, Azure Artos, that was ThreadX? They, they I bought think one. that was ThreadX. That, yeah, yeah, okay. yep. that was the thing. All these you know, all these cloud providers are buying. Are buying yeah, Amazon bought Free Amazon, Artos. Yeah. yeah, Azure bought, Microsoft bought ThreadX. And, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the same in the hardware world. Like all the yeah, totally. companies get bought by a bigger one. Let's say uh, recently was Maxim was acquired by PDA. Okay. Analog devices. Analog devices, yeah. Another one bites the dust, guys. Yes, it's, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's at the uh, end we will have like one crazy. big corporation yeah. which is right, called right. like a the right. semiconductor. <laughs> right, chip chip company. Uh, the chip you buy company, your yeah. you buy your parts from chip company. You send your data to data company, and then eventually data company buys chip company, and we just throw up our hands. We're like, all right, well, I guess. I'm gonna go flip burgers now. <laughs> I don't know exactly. like, what the hell do I do anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for now, we can sit around and wait for STM 32s to come available. Sorry, that's the last time I'll make that joke. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, yeah, just five, <laughs> five more years. It's it's really painful. I assume if you guys have a partnership, at least you're at least you know on the list of like people getting parts before schlubs like myself. So. We do, we do, but it's still, it's not easy peasy. Yeah, you're not, uh, well, you're not Apple, you're not, you know, you're not Microsoft or anyone who's making big things, so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And even, even for those, it's right now, it's a bit hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. Recently, we I mean, had yeah, a, Toyota, right? They can't get yeah. parts. It's like, okay. <laughs> they are cutting down the, like, uh, auto sale for about 40%, yeah. I believe. 
Yeah, it's yep. really hard. Yeah. Even, like, even like a company like Toyota, they were like a super conservative about buying the parts and That's right. yeah. like for the chips and now they're out of stock. Yep. It's, it's a yeah, tough time. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it is tough. It's good time to be in software. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in our production, so we are right now having a delay a bit about the, all the chips are no problem. We've yeah. found them, we sourced them, but the enclosure, man, the raw material yeah. for plastic that is also yep. running out and we are yep. being delayed for that as well. <laughs> right. Well, what if you just like shellac the whole thing and then stick the, the PCB out in the field, you know, just dangling wires with two double A's and, uh, you know, <laughs> well, that could work as a dev board that could work, you know, like, uh, make 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 the farm look like the server farm right you know like server farms they got rid of all the cases it's just bare boards and racks basically and they're just cooling and you know because it's so so much scale so now we just do that in the fields for agriculture and boom we're done you know just you need to yeah, really just that uh, formally coat the device so that it would <laughs> can formal coat the crap out of it and then you're done yeah <laughs> the problem is uh, is is the antenna so we have ah. tuned the device including the enclosure, including the battery holder PCB, which ah. is a secondary PCB. And yeah. if you remove the enclosure from the equation, the whole um, like resonant frequency of the antenna shifts quite drastically and yeah. it starts to perform very poorly. So it has oh, to have wow. that enclosure. <laughs> and it, because you saying because you tuned it to that, you put, you changed out inductors, capacitors, whatever yes. needed. So right? it, uh, the, the matching ah. network was tuned, including the enclosure, including the batteries, like alkaline huh. batteries all together it's yeah. one piece huh how much how much was that process when you were doing that was it like you're on the bench just swapping out components or what were you doing there practice antennas mm. yep. so it was part of our partnership but that's what basically they're doing they are first mm. doing the, the simulating simulation and then uh -huh. getting the suggested part values for the for the matching network and then uh -huh. on the real bench they're just basically soldering desoldering inductors yeah. and capacitors yeah. until they hit the sweet spot yep. yeah yeah uh. <laughs> which is interesting because in their early simulation because this is very tight design and uh, the two double a's are really close to the antenna they were uh. really worried that okay the antenna will perform poorly but in the in the actual device it turned out that the antenna performance is actually not that bad it's actually very good that given the, the proximity of the uh, battery it's so actually because in in their technology they call it a virtual antenna technology and uh, they're using ground plane to emit yep because battery is also one of them at least is part of the ground plane the, the it in extends the size and actually helps with the uh, emission that's <laughs> super cool yeah <laughs> So if you so actually that's an interesting point then too. So if you switched it, so you said using the two millimeter JST plug, you could switch out for a uh, like a lipo or something. Yeah, any but, any type of battery which can deliver, let's say more than two hundred milliamps, uh -huh. and uh, which but that would a, then change the ground plane as well, right? It, yes, not that necessarily would, that would, worse, but it would definitely change it because it's just a different shape and a different, you know, chemistry most internally. Definitely, and, most definitely, yeah. I mean. It would that's have cool. to be retuned again. Yeah, huh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that is that is really cool. I mean, so uh, what's the timeline on the, you said the, the two different builds, you said the $40 build will be hopefully 5,000 to 10,000 units. What's like rough timeline? That is planned for next year. That's uh -huh. planned for next year because we will definitely get bit by this component shortages. Sure. Yeah. yeah, of course. Even with this 500 run, it's not too much of a, uh, component but we still had to wait a couple of months to get those parts totally. and we are planning to start delivering the the first nodes next month hopefully and if everything goes well we are also planning to hold a small virtual conference dedicated for the generic node sometime in october or in november we had cool. to postpone it actually we were planning for september but yeah we had to wait for the enclosures unfortunately well that happens yeah <laughs> <laughs> And you guys have other conferences. I keep getting emails about other conferences. So Things Network yes. does, con or Things Industries, Things Network. We have one super big yeah. conference, uh -huh. which is every year annually in January, end of January, in Amsterdam, which is a mostly physical event. But last year, due to COVID, we had to make it online. 
but this year we are planning to make it more like a hybrid conference yeah partially uh, for those people who are not able to travel for them there will be definitely an online part also a physical part in amsterdam but all uh, across the year we also have a small uh, virtual conferences dedicated for one part of LoRaWAN. Let's say one was about the Think Stack, the other one was about like mm -hmm. using LoRaWAN in logistics applications, in maritime yep. applications. Another one will be hopefully about the generic node itself. Cool. And yeah, we also have uh, having like a local conferences. The pre-COVID times, we had one in India. After the COVID, maybe we'll we'll do more of those as well, like a smaller version of the Things Conference. Great. Well, do one in do one in North Carolina, man. Come, there's there's still <laughs> farmers here apparently. I don't know. <laughs> well, that could be a nice option for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I think that uh, you know people should definitely check this out. I I'm really excited to I, like I said I have mine. It's I got mine one of the early ones. It's somewhere in the stuff that's off yeah, camera here. Yeah, Chris, you started doing lots of firmware development. Maybe yeah, you can you can try to use our, our SDK. Just, yeah, yeah. Just do a recursive a pull from our GitHub and then cool. you'll have everything ready to go. Just We are using CMake and uh -huh. ARM GNU tools. So just install those and you'll be good to go. And we have options to use like a Docker, uh, even oh, VS cool. Code based, and also support for the STM32 Cube IDE. So you can import our project to the cube ID itself. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what Philip was on the show talking about last week or two weeks ago, depending on when this episode goes out. And uh, yeah, kind of like those build systems that just kind of getting mm -hmm. stuff really kind of instrumented and, and built up from the command line. And uh, yeah, it sounds like it's a, a good starting place. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. you can you can even use our SDK to develop for other sorts of Steam 32 uh -huh. WL devices. Ah. Cool. Because it's very similar to the official nu nuclear board from ST. All the pinouts are the same for yeah. the RF part. And you just have to change the, some of the I squared C ports or, or mm -hmm. UART ports, but RF yeah. part is, stays the same and pinouts are the same. It is That's compatible. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. How was it, I mean, pulling that in? I mean, you said there's a nuclear board. That's a really good. Those are really great starting points. I think that's yeah. a strong point of the ST micro ecosystem, rather. In terms of like the one thing with ST parts, it's always like the clock management always kind of felt weird to me. Like the <laughs> like you have to kind of like it's like very chained along. You have to make sure that this one's turned on and then this one and then this one and this yeah. one. And if there's if any of them are not, you're just like, well, it's not doing anything. You're like oh yeah. Well, it's in general it's an ARM thing because yeah. of the high speed bus, low speed bus. All the peripherals uh -huh. gets a different clock source, and especially if you have a, if you are using the internal clock source, and then you have yeah. to enable PLLs to get a higher yeah. Yeah. Uh, clock frequency. Uh, in this one, we are using for precise timing. We're using TCXO mm -hmm. for for the radio. And you can get those. <laughs> well, yeah, that was also one of the yeah. <laughs> hard part to get. I've heard, no, I've heard specifically one. with those. Yeah, yeah, they're they're hard. Last to find year, actually, and... there was a big fire in in China, and was like. A, yeah. Right. Right. So that was yeah. a huge hit. Yep. We had to mm. change a part that we are using to a different one because of that. Yeah. Cool. Well, or can where can people find you online? I mean, I think following your Twitter is a lot of fun. So where can people yeah. find you on Twitter <laughs> and all otherwise? Well, I, I'm mostly on Twitter. You can you can find me as a, as a, with the tag name Aziri Maker. I'll be there, and you can also message me there. And otherwise, I I have a like a blog where I post about my Penguino boards. It's called Makertronica.com, and yeah, over there I also have contact details. So feel free to contact me with whatever questions about Laura or about the boards, the open source designs I made. Also on GitHub. Yeah, great. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us here, telling us about the generic. No, this thing is uh, very exciting, and I'm excited to try out more Laura and Laura Wayne stuff. I think it's going to be a, it's a, it's a lot of fun things that are out there, especially for low power, broad sensor networks. There's a lot of, a lot of need for that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. I've been a long time listener of this show, and yeah, it's really, it feels great to be here. Thanks. All right, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Have a good day.